easy thing to do when you first come on board. Um, but you know what? The, the, the concept was sound. We got our ducks in a row. We started to, to um, get to be profitable quite quickly. Um, we, got some, uh, we got some funding from one of our customers. We were in the business of putting high-speed internet into hotels, which back in 2001 was a novel concept. That, you know, not a lot of people really thought it was something that had a lot of legs. But we did have a few good <coughs> customers like Marriott, like uh, Fairmont, who said, we're prepared to pay you in advance if you can commit the resources to get this installed over the next six months. So they actually gave us some working capital and helped us get going. So VC who did some of the money. And as you probably all know, that business sort of took off. So we went from a million and a half in revenue, losing three million in 2001 when I first joined to 2004 when I took the public. Um, we did 25 million in revenue, put four million to the bottom line, and we had a run rate of about 40 million. So I went from 30 employees to 10 to 300 in a period of about two and a half years, three years. Um, venture back uh, business, but I will tell you, from my standpoint, the investment didn't help the company grow. What I did live under, though, was uh, VCs who owned two of the uh, four, two of the five seats on the board, and were very clearly in control of the, the company and the direction of the company. So store that one. Anyway, we had a good exit. Um, sometime over beer, I'll tell you the rest of the story. But I lost my job in a hostile takeover with a, a Japanese firm, uh, which was probably the best thing that could have ever happened. So I did a little bit of consulting, uh, worked out in Salt Lake City, moved down here, um, and I'm gonna tell you bits and pieces about a new venture that I've got going called Players Golf Network. And as we start talking about uh, raising capital, I'm just in the midst of raising capital for this new venture now. So I'll, I'll try to use it as a straw man to, to explain where I think some of the value for investing is. And in my spare time, I have a horse farm in Georgia. Let's, let's change gears. I did say there's a few things I'm not going to tell you about. Um, I don't think we should talk about uh, businesses that require extraordinary amounts of capital to get going. Uh, big pharma, um, in, in fact, the healthcare field in general, uh, natural resources, exploration and development, those are the kinds of things for which um, there are specific um, sort of lines of venture raising beyond the scope of this discussion. I don't want to spend a lot of time on government funding programs. There are a lot of them out there. I think from a, the standpoint of uh, a bit of a hand up or to augment what you're doing, they're great and you should always seek them out. But I'm also a firm believer that businesses need to be sustainable and you can't rely on government funding to succeed. Also, now I'm going to talk a lot about light, later stage investment, Me mezzanine funding, um, other types of debt structures, um, IPOs, RTOs, reverse takeovers, pipes, which are private investment by public, in public entity, and other three letter and four letter acronyms. We're just not going to Oh, and that, that image of that building you saw, that was a uh, high-tech startup that did a $64 million Series A round um, because they were a spin out, out of Baxter or one of the big pharmaceuticals. That's beyond the scope of this discussion. Let's talk a common language on just a few definitions. And again, this is where I'd like your input, your thoughts as to whether we're covering the things you want to cover. Um, Angels and VCs, people hear about them all the time. Uh, my definition of an angel typically is someone that spends their own money or invests their own money, and a VC is usually a professional.
professional that invests other people's money. The lines are getting blurred a little bit when we talk about what we see in the future here, or we're starting to see in the future are these micro VCs or super angels, depending on whether you want to be derogatory or <laughs> supportive. The VCs call this new group of super angels micro VCs, trying to push them down. And the angels are calling them super angels, which is growing in stature. Uh, but that's, to me, that's sort of the common difference between the two. Angels are typically spending their own money. VCs are usually investing a group of people's money, funds money. Um, there are different stages of investment. Um, typically, the first round is called seed, and after that, they are usually later <coughs> Series A, Series B, and Series C. And each of those uh, rounds of investment typically come with different requirements, and in many cases, it'll be different types of investors participating in each of those rounds. In the old days, two or three years ago, you would also see term sheets that involve tranches. And tranches were usually a commitment for later stage funding based on a certain um, formula that the, the entrepreneur or the, the investee had to achieve. So I'll promise you that I'm going to hit this level of revenue, and in return, you will then put that much money into our company. The problem with tranches is you up front, you typically were um, valuing your company for the future at the present, instead of waiting to see what it was worth. And usually the tranches came with really punitive downsides, that if you don't deliver on what you say you were going to deliver, I'm going to take all of your company, or 50% plus one, so I now have control. So tranches, in my mind, are still out there. I just saw somebody the other day saying they were going to do a series of tranche investments. But you don't see them that often anymore, in my mind. Uh, incubators and accelerators. Incubators um, have been around for a while, and they're just physical environments, typically, for startups to come and share and take advantage of shared resources. They've morphed into something. Um, it's known more now as accelerators or startup schools for, in some cases, um, Y Combinator, um, AngelPad, or some of the other tech stars tech star. out of, out of uh, Boulder. And what those are typically are investor um, supported environments where uh, qualifying entrepreneurs go and live for a period of time and in return, get access to the capital, access to resources, often you know, physical space, technology resources, and then they're also surrounded by other resources that the investor or the operators bring in. So um, quite often, you either qualify based on winning a contest, um, on sending them a business plan and applying, and they usually do it in, in sort of periods of time, um, four to six months, they typically turn you over. And they will also, in many cases, uh, look for a nominal five, six, some cases 10% of your company in return for participation in the accelerator. Smart money or dumb money, another one I hear an awful lot of. I don't know a whole lot of dumb money. Um, to me, they're dumb like foxes usually, but the traditional um, discussion is smart money, usually comes with uh, other services. Oh, they'll open doors, they'll bring some domain expertise with them. They will bring uh, something beyond just the capital that they're going to invest, whereas dumb money typically is passive investment. I would say, in my mind, smart money isn't nearly as smart as it thinks it, it is quite often. And dumb money, if they were able to write checks, they weren't that dumb to get there to be able to write checks on a startup. So be cautious. Usually, in my mind, the dumb money is a lot smarter than they act. Um, the other thing, though, that will come up is if down the road you take nothing but dumb money, it's sometimes considered uh, a term that you'll see in the market called signaling, which says to professional investors they were unable to, to raise money from those of us who do this for a living. And I think that's a bunch of hogwash. 
I think, you know, raise money on the best terms possible and on the investors based on what you believe they bring to the table and whether they fit with your criteria. But that term signaling, you will start to see um, if you start spending time with the so-called professional investors. Uh, pre and post money valuations, um, for those of you that don't know, know you, you obviously you raise money based on a specific valuation. Usually people talk about the post money valuation um, when they put the money in. So if I need to raise $3 million and I'm willing to give up 30% of the company to do that, that's a $10 million post money valuation, $7 million pre. So I give up 30%, I get the person's $3 million, uh, they get 30% of the company or uh, third of, a little less than a third of, of a $10 million pre and post. One of the things that will come up though, smart investors, not necessarily smart money, but smart investors will say is that <coughs> before or after all of the options have been exercised. <coughs> so is that fully diluted? And that's something you need to be aware of because it can make a significant amount of difference if you put aside 20, 25% of an option pool for the staff that you're going to, to build into your company. So it's very important to know whether or not you're raising money on a uh, fully diluted basis or not. Because it can come as a surprise to one party or the other. If it isn't figured out. And then there's a whole ton of term sheet requirements that are just um, uh, term sheet terms that I'm not going to raise here. We can, there's time for questions afterwards. but. Double dip two times participating preps is what I lived under with guest tax, which meant in most circumstances, when the company was finally liquidated, or there was a liquidity event, we were sold, or <coughs> we raised more money, or had a, a private investor come and get us, they got two times their original investment out first, that's the two times participation, and then they also got their equal share, which was at that time 30% of the company, of the remaining proceeds. So two times double dip participating preps. The only time it wouldn't go into effect was if we went public, so we went public. <laughs> so, and there's lots more. We can spend more time talking about those at the end. I, I do want to talk though about what are the right sources of funding and again, you guys, I'm not doing all the talking, but raise your hand if you've got some others, know of others. These are the ones I see most often. Uh, the founder themselves. And me and my classic, I just read a good blog today that said, um, you hear all these you know, great stories about how somebody went to the wall with their uh, MasterCard or Visa and funded the company for an extended period of time. And this person went on to write, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. You know, at 27% interest, your cousin Vinny can loan you the money cheaper. You know, so I'm not sure trying to fund your company with, uh, with credit cards actually is the smartest thing. But the implication here, I think, is within your own means, start the company, bootstrap it, use sweat equity, whatever it takes to get up and on. The next stage typically, or the, the next closest, is friends and family. We talked a little bit about angels. Uh, strategic investors. Um, you will find, depending on the line of business you're in, there are often organizations that stand to benefit from your success. And if you know who they are, and if you have something that um, they can't necessarily steal or copy or do better themselves, you can also, you can often find uh, investment from that. And that could be an adjacent organization that's gonna benefit because they're downstream and if you expand the market, they'll be able to sell something into it. Or it could be customers or suppliers. One of the reasons for the bubble bursting in 2001 was um, there was an awful lot of growth in the networking space and companies like Northern Telecom and Cisco and others had made a huge practice of funding startups with immense lines of credit for them to be able to buy hardware, sell it, and get it installed long before they ever paid for it. 